Welcome back. Today we will discuss characteristic functions. So, the, if x is a random variable, then the characteristic function uh, is defined as follows c x of t is defined as expectation of e power i t x ok, where t is some real number ok. So, this t is some real parameter x is your random variable this e power i is of course, your uh, i squared is minus 1 right it is your square root of u, uh, minus 1 uh, e power i t x is a complex valued random variable right. So, which is something again we have not really uh, talked about. So, you can so you can actually take this as expectation of cos t x plus i times expectation of sin t x. Cos t x and sin t x are random variables parameters by t and you take their expectations. So, expectation of cos t x plus i times expectation of sin t x. Now, this you know what it means right because these are all real value random variables. So, that is the uh, definition of a characteristic function ok. So, it, it, this is again defined for any random variable right. So, for any random variable with probability law p x. So, p x is your law then c x of t is nothing but integral e power i t little x uh, d p x right. So, given your probability law you can compute the characteristic function. Again here e power i t x is just cos t x plus i sin t x. So, you can evaluate the real and imaginary part uh, as usual ok. So, now this so why do you need this characteristic function see this characteristic function is analogous to a Fourier transform just like your uh, moment generating function is an analogous to a Laplace transform. In particular when you have a density if x is a continuous random variable with probability density function f x then c x of t equal to integral e power i t x uh, f x of x t x x is from minus infinity to infinity. Because in the case of a continuous random variable you know that radon equilibrium theorem tells you that d p x is f x d x right. Yeah, so, this is like a Fourier transform of the PDF except that Fourier transform usually has a negative sign here it is the only difference ok. So, now why do you need this? So, why not just the, uh, the moment generating function? So, the reason is so, the main reason is that the moment generating function does not always exist uh, outside s is equal to 0 right as s is equal to 0 moment generating function is equal to uh, 1, but the, as we saw in the case of a Cauchy random variable for example, the moment generating function was undefined for all other arguments. But on the other hand the characteristic function is always well defined and it is finite ok for any random variable. So, the reason that is true is the following. So, if you look at uh, so, ok. So, if you is true more generally, but if you just look at this for a continuous random variable, if you take absolute value, the absolute value of this integral, then you can bound it above by the integral of the absolute value, right. But the absolute value of e power i t x is 
1. So, you will have so the absolute value of C x of t is upper bounded by 1 always right. So, uh, so this integral in particular you can show is uh, uniformly convergent for all t right for all real t this is uniformly convergent ok. Absolutely convergent therefore, uniformly convergent. So, this is always well defined that is one thing. So, you can handle even random variables such as uh, Cauchy. So, you can basically handle these heavy tail random variables which decay is lower than all these exponentials like Cauchy and so on for which the moment generating function is not defined outside s is equal to 0, but characteristic function will be defined ok. The other reason is that at some level this uh, the inversion of characteristic function is a little bit easier than inversion of uh, moment generating function for the simple reason that uh, just like the inversion of Fourier transform is a little bit easier right you can write down an explicit formula which does not involve some very uh, very complicated contour integrals over the complex plane and so on right. So, it is a little bit easier. So, in the case of moment generating function you have to do some pattern matching here you can actually write down some more elementary formula for the inversion that is a more practical reason. So, there is one thing I want to uh, point out. So, le let me just give an example right. So, I think my point will be clear if I give you an example of let us say uh, x is exponential with parameter mu right. So, f x is mu e power minus mu x for x greater than or equal to 0. So, uh, you are used to computing Fourier transforms in your signals and systems. Uh, so, you would expect the characteristic function to be the same thing except that uh, in your Fourier transform we have to be careful about the minus. Uh, so, wherever you have a minus in the Fourier transform you have to uh, get rid of that minus essentially right. So, if you have so, if you in whatever answers you know for your Fourier transforms replace your argument with minus t right then you should get your characteristic function. So, just as yes that is true right, but I want to make some uh, cautionary remarks. Uh, uh, so, I, I have to give you some caveats here. So, so in particular so if you try to if you write this. So, here is my pdf and my characteristic function will be integral 0 to infinity mu e power minus mu x e power i t x d x right. Fine. So, now so this is I mean again this is an integral you would have computed uh, in signals and systems. So, what you would normally do in signals and systems is that you treat you would just write this as e power minus mu minus i t times x right. So, you will write this as e power 0 to infinity mu e power minus mu minus i t times x d x correct and then uh, you will just and then the answer is therefore, mu over mu minus i t right this is for t in r valid for all all real t. So, essentially in going from here to here what you are basically treating is this mu i mu minus i t you are treating is the as some a some real a right uh, and then you are just writing this integral down pretending that mu minus i t is some real number whereas, it is not a real number right it is in fact a complex number right. So, so, in this particular case I mean and you would have uh, similarly for the case of your in your signals and systems you will get a plus here that is all right the Fourier transform of this exponential uh, curve is a uh, you will have a plus here that is the only difference right. Now, this this step is not really correct it so happens that uh, uh, by sheer luck you get this answer if you just pretend that this is a real number ok. So, what you really have is a function of a complex variable right and this integral 
is should be treated as the integral over the contour of the real line. Okay. So, in order to evaluate this integral uh, strictly speaking you have to perform contour integration. Right. So, in fact, the Fourier transform that you have been evaluating in signals and systems is in fact strictly speaking a contour integral. Okay. You see what I mean. So, this is something you do in signals and systems right when you compute Fourier transforms this is not really justified. It so happens that in this case you get the correct answer even if you perform the contour integration correctly you get this answer. Okay. It so happens that if you treat this as a real number you, you happen to get the right answer by luck. Okay. There are examples where you will not get the correct answer. Okay. If you just pretend that mu minus i t is a is a real number. Um, Huh. So, uh, let me yeah now that I am talking about that uh, let me just give you a I told you the example of a Cauchy right. So, the one of the nice things about the characteristic function is it can help you handle things like the Cauchy distribution which the moment generating function does not allow you to handle right. So, if you have a Cauchy so if you have the Cauchy f x of x is 1 over pi 1 over 1 plus x square right. So, in this case your c x of t is equal to integral minus infinity infinity uh, uh, e power i t x over pi times 1 plus x square d x. Okay. So, now in this case actually you cannot explicit you cannot pretend this i t is some real number and do this integral okay, and you will not get the answer. Okay. In fact, you might have done the see you have what you have after all is a function that looks like 1 over 1 plus x squared right and you have computed it is you know it is Fourier transform right. I mean do you know it is Fourier transform what it looks like the functional form e power ha huh, so you so yeah so let's go back to so you think the, so the you know from your signal systems that the transform should look like e power minus some constant times absolute value of t right so just let's just go back to fourier transforms from your signals and systems for a little bit so if you have so you have so what do you use x so f of x so f of x and f of t for Fourier transform uh, this is your function this is your transform right. You, so, you have you you know you write down relations like this right. So, if you have e power minus a x x greater than or equal to 0 the transform the Fourier transform is like 1 over a plus i t right. And so, and you have e power minus uh, a absolute x right you have to help me with this. So, this transforms to what uh, so something uh, 2 a right 2 a over a square plus r uh, right. see you know these by heart you know these by heart right. So, good. So, now what do you do? So, so this transform you the you, you compute this explicitly again in computing this you will pretend that i t is a real number and you know add this up and then you get this answer right. Then you will invoke Fourier duality right to say that oh if you have uh, something like 1 over 1 plus x squared here right you should have something like e power minus absolute t I am missing some constants okay. uh, I am surely missing some constants here, but I, I do not really care about it. Uh, I am just saying that if you are given a function that looks like uh, the transform you use duality and say then the transform should look like this right that is what you do right. So, why do you not integrate this function pretending that e power i t x is a. So, you see what I am saying right you never calculate the Fourier transform of this by integration you always invoke Fourier duality right. So, I so, so the reason is so in signals and systems uh, you explicitly calculate the transform by integrating in precisely those cases where you can get away by pretending that i t is a real number. Okay. In cases like this where you cannot get away by pretending that i t is a real number you are told that do not do not integrate just use Fourier duality or some other property to get the answer. Now, the fact of the matter is in all these cases 
just blindly integrating this as a pretending this i t to be a real number is actually wrong. Some cases it gives you the right answer, some cases it does not. Okay, so, this is something I want to point out. Okay. Actually doing this is possible, okay, but you need contour integration. Okay, so, uh, that is not something I will expect of you. I would just want to mention that these integrals are not, I mean you are no, no longer an undergraduate studying signals and systems. So, I think you should at least know that there is more to it than what you studied in signals and systems. So, if you have something like this, so you have a function that has uh, 1 over 1 plus x squared, right. So, you have to essentially use contour integration and then invoke uh, the residue theorem. Okay. You might have studied the residue theorem in complex analysis. So, what you do in evaluating something like this is that, so this guy has 2 poles, right this 1 over 1 plus x square has 2 poles, you have a pole at i, you have a pole at minus i, right. So, you are basically integrating like that, right over this line. So, you approximate, so you, you what you do is you perform contour integration over a big contour like that and then you compute that integral using the residue 2 pi i times the residue at i and then you similarly do it for this pole and then you have to argue that that integral and that integral will be 0 right and finally, you will get some answer right and in fact, you will get the answer you expect I think you, you will get e power minus absolute t. Okay, you have to do it separately for t greater than 0 and t less than 0 and you will get this answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, you have to even here you have to do contour integration right, but it so happens that you get this answer which you can with this you can believe this is harder to believe for you right that is because you can no longer treat e power i t as a real number. So, is my point clear? So, you so, even in Fourier transforms, this is how you should do it, okay, strictly speaking. Even when you are finding the Fourier transform of this exponential function, uh, you have to actually do contour integration. Okay. Uh, so, normally what you do in signal systems is you pretend that this is real, but you only do that in cases where you can get away and in cases where you cannot get away, you use some other trick. Right? Uh, yeah, I am just pointing that out. Okay. Actually, the yeah, so this is a very useful transform to know. Okay, for a Cauchy, e power minus absolute t is the characteristic function. Any questions so far? See, in cases where the moment generating function exists in an interval, you can actually obtain the characteristic function by simply putting s is equal to i t. Okay. So, when the moment generating function exists in some interval around the origin, you know that the moment generating function is an analytic function and therefore, it is in fact analytic on the imaginary axis as well. So, in those cases you can suppose in the in this case, right. Uh, so, you, you can just put i t s is equal to i t even in the case of let us say in the case of the Gaussian right you can blindly put s is equal to i t to get the characteristic function. So, let me just state that uh, let me just state some elementary properties. So, elementary properties. if y equal to a x plus b uh, c y of t is equal to 
e power i b t c of c x of a t. Okay, this is again from uh, definition. Yeah, so, if you have independent random variables x and y uh, and z is equal to x plus y, the characteristic function of z is given by the product of the two characteristic functions. Okay. This is similar to the property for moment generating functions, except you have an advantage. What? What is the advantage? It exists, right. So, if you if I mean the same thing is true for moment generating function, but if you are dealing with let us say two Cauchy random variables, the moment generating function will not exist. Right. So, if you want to figure out if x and y are Cauchy distributed iid Cauchy distributed for example, like that, if you want to figure out uh, if you want to figure out what the sum is like, right, you cannot use moment generating function, but you can use characteristic functions. Right. So, in particular you can do this example for yourself if x and y are independent and identically distributed according to the Cauchy distribution you know it is characteristic function. So, if z is equal to the sum of two standard Cauchy distributions its characteristic function will be e power minus twice absolute t correct. So, you would imagine that so, if you invert that uh, characteristic function you would imagine that you will get another what kind of a so it will be another Cauchy distribution with a different parameter right. So, what I am saying is that you will multiply this characteristic function of x and the characteristic function of y is the same thing right. So, the characteristic function of z will be e power minus twice absolute value of t right which looks of the same functional form right it looks like e power minus a absolute t and therefore, z must also be a Cauchy distribution with parameter square root of 2 right correct. So, using characteristic functions you can figure out that sum of two independent Cauchy is also a Cauchy which you cannot figure out using moment generating function. So, the proof of this is straightforward by the way right it is just from x this is just expectation of e power i t z right. So, z is equal to x plus y and then this proof is exactly similar to the proof for the moment generating function. So, now you so you now you know a new result you know that sum of two independent Gaussians is a Gaussian now you also know that sum of two independent Cauchy distributions is a Cauchy distribution and you cannot figure that out using moment generating function you have to use characteristic functions correct. So, this Cauchy is also a stable distribution so called stable distribution you keep adding independent Cauchy you get keep getting other Cauchy distributions okay, just like for the case of the Gaussian which we know right. For the Gaussian case you can use characteristic function or moment generating function because they both exist no problem. Uh, this so these two are elementary properties. Uh, what else? So you have. Okay, so this is not an elementary property, but I will not. I will state it without a proof. So uh, if.
m x of s less than infinity for s in minus epsilon epsilon then uh, c x of t equal to m x of i t. This is just what I mentioned earlier, right. If you have see if your moment generating function is only defined at the origin then bad luck you cannot really I mean it may be a very I mean it may not say much about the, uh, the density, but if you have s if you have the moment generating function defined in a neighborhood of the origin then you know that some very nice properties kick in right the moment generating function is analytic. Uh, so, it gets defined in the entire complex plane and in particular it will be analytic on the j omega axis or the j i whatever axis you call it vertical axis right. So, you can just substitute s is equal to i t and uh, you can get the characteristic function ok. So, so if you have x is normal 0 1 uh, we know uh, m x of s equal to e power uh, s squared over 2 right and this is true for all s in the complex plane right. So, c x of t will be equal to m x of i t which will be equal to e power minus t squared over 2 for all t belonging to r ok. So, the characteristic function of a standard Gaussian is e power minus t squared over 2 right. So, it also looks like a standard Gaussian right it looks like a e power minus except for the 1 over square root of 2 pi right. Yeah. So, and the, then you invoke suppose you invoke this property right then you can figure out the characteristic function of say let us say if y is equal to uh, sigma x plus mu right then y will become normal mu sigma squared right. In that case your uh, characteristic function c y of t will be equal to you apply that rule right it will you will get e power i mu t times c x of a t which will be e power minus sigma square t square over 2 ok. I am just using this rule. So, that gives you the characteristic function of even non standard Gaussian mean mu variance sigma square. Uh, so, now that you know this if you have two independent Gaussians y 1 and y 2 with parameters mu 1 sigma 1 mu 2 sigma 2 you can sh you can show that uh, z the which is the sum of the two will also be Gaussian with the parameters mu is adding up and the sigma squares adding up right. So, you can get it from here, but this result you can get it using even moment generating function right whereas in the Cauchy case you had to use the characteristic function right because the moment generating function does not exist is this clear. Yeah, so, this is uh, yeah, this is I guess not particularly elementary, but uh, we will not prove this ok. Inversion theorem. 
So, this uh, this is just like the inverse of Fourier transform ok. So, it is a highly non trivial theorem by the way I will just state the inversion theorem for characteristic functions. If two random variables have the same characteristic function, then their CDFs are equal or the same. So, without proof. Further, if x is a continuous random variable, then the PDF can be recovered from the characteristic function. as follows So, I believe this holds only for all for every x where um, I believe it holds for every x where f x is continuous. Huh. Uh, so, if you have so this is like the Fourier transform inversion right except so I guess for the Fourier transform inversion again you are used to writing integral minus infinity infinity it is not quite the same as saying the limit t tending to infinity minus t to t that is because I mean if you write minus infinity to infinity these two limits can go at different rates right. So, but this is the correct statement ok. So, you have so you have limit t tending to infinity 1 by 2 pi integral minus t to t e power minus i t x c x of t d t. So, this holds so, so this holds where f x is continuous ok um, and if I remember correctly. So, this I do not exactly remember I believe that if your f x is not continuous if x x f x has a jump then this inverse transform converges to the middle point of the discontinuity right. This is again from your uh, Fourier inversion theorem right that is something I do not quite uh, completely remember correctly, but this holds for uh, points of disc of continuity. If you have discontinuity uh, the inverse transform converges to the middle point of the discontinuity ok. There is a non trivial result ok. So, this just says actually again this is something we will not really use so often right you will it is much easier to usually do pattern matching and figure out what the density is if at all there is a density right. But this theorem just says oh you know what given your characteristic function you can obtain your density whenever there is a density ok. And in cases when there is no density there is actually a more general way to recover the uh, the CDF ok. Uh, I do not know if I should state that yeah. So, let me not state that because I have uh, I do not have that much time. So, the characteristic function is defined even when x is not continuous and if you are given the characteristic function of a random variable which is not a continuous random variable you can there is a way to invert it to obtain the CDF ok maybe I will put that in the notes ok. Let me not spend class time on it.
Okay, so this is a th very important theorem. So this I will call these defining properties. Okay. So you will very soon realize why these properties are defining properties of a characteristic function. If x is a random variable with characteristic function c x of t, then property a c x of 0 equal to 1 and absolute value of c x of t less than or equal to 1 for all t in r. Okay. This is something you will understand very easily, right? C x of 0 is obviously 1, it is the expectation of 1, right? We are putting t equal to 0. And I argued that absolute value of c x of t is less than or equal to 1, correct? I think I just I, I did not write it out, but I argued it out. B c x of t is uniformly continuous on R. i.e. for all t in R, there exists a psi of h, maybe I should call it, this is not the conditional expectation or anything, okay, then maybe I should call it, I call psi for conditional expectation, right. So, maybe I should call it phi of h, okay, phi of h which goes to 0 as h goes to 0 such that absolute value of c x of t plus h minus c x of t is less than or equal to phi of h. Okay. So, this is the second property. So, this essentially says that characteristic function is a continuous function of t is actually a uniformly continuous function of t uniform uh, uniform continuity is a stronger form of continuity. Okay. Uh, uniform continuity implies continuity, but not the other way around. Uh, in particular uniform com continuity is exactly what I have said here. Okay. So, normally you mean the, see, by continuity you mean that this absolute difference is small as a is goes to 0 as h tends to 0, right. That is what you mean by continuity. But in the case of uniform continuity, no matter what t you choose, this absolute difference is uniformly bounded by this function phi of h. See, normally you only need that this different goes to 0 as h goes to 0, correct. But here you are demanding that no matter what t is you can choose a phi of h such that this difference is uniformly bounded above by phi of h and this phi of h is a function that goes to 0 as h goes to 0. Okay, in some sense uh, you are saying that this difference is this difference itself does not depend on the value of t right it is uh, irrespective of the value of t it is bounded above by some phi of h right that is stronger than a continuous function right it's saying more than continuity it is called uniform continuity. Okay. C x, the third property is C x is a non negative definite kernel. I e <coughs> for any real for any 
n and real t1 t2 dot dot, dot tn and any complex z1 z2 dot dot, dot zn we have we have sum over j k z j c x of t j minus t k z k conjugate is greater than or equal to 0. So, this is a property that seems this is a very fundamental property of characteristic functions. Uh, it does look a little bit um, it looks a little bit hard to digest at the beginning right. I, I will help you parse this. So, you are, what you are saying is that you are considering these complex quadratic forms right this is like complex quadratic form uh, you are fixing some n all right fix any positive integer n and you pick any real t 1 t 2 t n you want any complex z 1 z 2 z n you want ok. And then you are looking at so, let me put this in a matrix form. So, that is a little bit easier to digest right. So, you are looking at a matrix in which the i j th entry is c x of t j minus t k this is the i j th entry of the matrix or j k th entry of the matrix ok and therefore, the diagonal entries will be what? Ones, right? They're all ones because you'll have t j minus t j, which is zero. C x of zero is one. Right? You'll have ones on this main diagonal, all the diagonal, and you'll have these these kind of terms on the j kth entry. And then you're essentially what you're doing is so really what you're doing is that you're taking the z's like that, right? Uh, or maybe this is z z bars right these are all z bars this is z 1 z 2 z n right you are looking at a quadratic form of that kind that is what this is come to think of it right. And you are saying that for no matter what these t t j s are no matter what these z i s are this quadratic form is always this complex quadratic form is always non negative ok. Fine. So, is it clear what it what it says? So, I am saying that this is exactly the same as this. So, you arrange your you choose your tj's and you form this matrix right. Uh, then this this matrix will have this matrix is a non negative kernel in the sense that all complex quadratic forms are non negative ok. So, we have to prove this uh, results right. So, this first first bit is easy is not it this is quite trivial this and this needs some work ok. Uh, so, how am I on time I am probably yeah, I just have like 2 3 minutes Maybe I will just try and do part b. So, it says 5 more minutes. So, let me just do part b and part c maybe we will do next class ok. So, I am trying to prove uh, uniform continuity. So, you have absolute value of c x of t plus h minus c x of t is equal to absolute value of e power expectation of e power i t plus h x minus uh, e power i 
t x, isn't it? Right? So that is equal to I can write this as absolute value of is that right? I think this is right. Hmm? Absolute value of expectation of e power i t x times e power i t h minus 1 right agree with that hmm h x yeah sorry right correct now this will become so this you can show is this is not equal to expectation of uh, e power i h x minus 1 correct because this absolute value will be equal to 1 ok. So, this is what you have to look at right. So, this is like so if you look at this this is what. So, this will be like the absolute value will be like so if you write e power i h x as cos h x plus i sin h x right. So, this will become so so absolute value of e power i h x minus 1 is equal to square root of uh, you can show that this is nothing but square root of 2 minus 2 cos h x just trigonometric identity ok and then this is is equal to 2 times the absolute value of sin h x over 2 correct. Hmm? So, I am just expanding this cos x. So, just uh, the absolute value of a complex number is you know is equal to square root of the real part square imaginary part square simplify sin square plus cos square equal to 1 you do all that you end up with this. So, essentially what we are saying is that this guy will be less than or equal to 2 is not it. So, this is essentially less than or equal to 2. Uh, so, this is my so ok. So, this is my this is what my phi of h is ok. So, I have to prove that my phi of h tends to 0 as h tends to 0, but as my h tends to 0 say by I have to use dominated convergence theorem now. So, I can take the limit inside right. So, it is a bounded so it is dominated above by 2 right. So, I can take the limit inside and this guy obviously goes to 0 right as h goes to 0 correct. So, by dominated convergence theorem we will get the result that is the step I was missing ok. So, maybe we will recap this uh, next class ok stop here.